All right, guys, I'm like three viral Republican lies about immigration behind. So I'm going to make this quick. No, the Hells Angels did not travel to Aurora, Colorado to fight a Venezuelan street gang that took over an apartment complex. However, yes, I would watch a Sons of Anarchy Judge Dredd crossover directed by Paul Verhoeven, now that you mention it. When I first saw Republican propaganda outlets like Fox News repeating this as truth, I immediately knew that it was fake because... Obviously, the Hells Angels are an outlaw motorcycle club, not the Justice League. I know that for the past 76 years that they've been in existence, Americans have worked really hard to romanticize the Hells Angels as some kind of freedom-loving, tough-talking brotherhood of cool dudes. But the reality is that they're a loose collection of mostly white men who enjoy doing crimes, like drug trafficking and mixing up plural and possessive nouns and other standard gang shit. If you've never read Hunter S. Thompson's book on his experience with the Hells Angels, I highly recommend it. It's a surprisingly complex look inside the Hells Angels as they were back in the 60s. As that book illustrates, there's also a rich history of racism amongst the Hells Angels. And so sure, it wouldn't shock me if you told me that some particular chapter of Hells Angels decided to go beat up some immigrants, but this black and white framing, so to speak, of Venezuelan immigrants as dangerous gang members and Hells Angels as patriotic lovers of law and order is just obviously idiotic. What I didn't know from the headlines, though, was how this particular idiotic story came to be. Why Venezuelans? Why Aurora, Colorado, a town that I previously only heard of thanks to a particularly memorable mass shooting? I live in the United States, so a mass shooting does have to be particularly weird in order to stick in my memory. Anyway, I was curious how this story came to be, and I regret to inform you that I'm going to be extremely on brand here. This is not a story about how American towns are filling with violent criminals because of unchecked open borders. This is a story about how American towns are being destroyed by unchecked capitalism. I know, it's always capitalism. The end of every Scooby-Doo episode, you rip off that mask and it's just old man capitalism once again. It all started at the end of August when video footage from an Aurora apartment building went viral. It showed several men with guns breaking into an apartment complex in Aurora, Colorado, and outlets like Fox News labeled the men as potentially being members of the Tren de Aragua, or TDA, Venezuelan street gang further suggesting that the entire building had been taken over by the gang. Then for some reason, I guess just because it's social media and that's what social media is for now, people began sharing old footage of groups of guys on motorcycles claiming that this was the heroic white American Hells Angels on the way to murder the mean old bad immigrant gang. So the Hells Angels part was pretty quickly debunked. Too quickly for Elon Musk, I guess, because last I saw, community notes are only just a vague media presented out of context with no further context being offered. Great. But what about the Venezuelan gang? Is that part true? It didn't take me long to dig through the Fox News and New York Post bullshit in order to find accurate reporting from the local news. You know, the people who are there in Aurora seeing what's going on. As far back as March of 2023, local news outlet Denver 7 has been documenting the appalling conditions that are forced upon tenants of the Fitzsimmons apartments, which, like every slum I've ever lived in or near, is also known by a dozen other names, many of them sarcastic. Tenants contacted Denver 7 because they had gone several winter months without heat uh, but with plenty of mold and rodents. Their landlord, CBZ Management, had refused to answer any of their complaints, so Denver 7 came and documented the disgusting state of the apartments. Unfortunately, they couldn't stay too long because they themselves reported feeling too unsafe and they ran away. I'll pause here to note that CBZ Management, despite owning properties in Colorado, is actually based in Brooklyn, New York. 
They also own properties in New York, and judging by the Google reviews, it doesn't appear that tenants benefit from being in the same state as their landlord. Across many properties in either state, tenants are united on the fact that they are slumlords. Rodents, bullshit fees, water falling from the ceiling, over and over again, zero response from any form of management. So that report was in March of 2023. It took more than a year for the city to finally take action as they announced in early August of 2024 that they would close the apartments for multitude of code violations. Denver 7 returned to the apartments to see what was happening, and they found mountains of trash piled up at the property because CBZ just stopped garbage collection. The tenants banded together to raise money to hire a company to haul it away, but obviously they couldn't afford to keep up with that indefinitely. Denver 7 reached out to CBZ for comment, as they did last year with no success. This time, though, CBZ went and hired a PR firm to respond. The PR firm is the group that announced that the problem was not, in fact, years of slumlord mismanagement, but the evil Venezuelan gang who had not only taken over that property, but also several other properties owned by CBZ, leading one Google reviewer to wonder if the gang was on the CBZ payroll. The city responded by saying, no, the code violations have nothing to do with any gang activity. Further evidence against this is that vicious gangs of criminals rarely purposely keep a landlord from improving the place where they're living, like stopping them from picking up trash and instead choosing to pay out of pocket for garbage removal. That doesn't usually happen. They also usually don't have entire families with babies you know, in the gang. That said, I have no doubt that crime probably is rising in and around that apartment complex. The local police report that they investigated 41 crimes at the property in 2022, 84 crimes in 2023, and 66 crimes in 2024 through July 31st. And that's because, as Princeton sociologists detailed after completing a study in 2023, Rundown properties, places with faulty window locks, rickety doors, and malfunctioning lights, make crimes like burglary that much easier. Second, frequent evictions undermine residential stability and neighborhood cohesion. It's hard to develop trust or a sense of community, a key aspect in crime prevention, if people are constantly getting evicted. Third, neglectful landlords rarely visit their properties and may be more likely to turn a blind eye to illegal activity. Fourth, these landlords more often rent to tenants who may be more likely to commit crimes and are turned away by other landlords. In their study, the researchers looked at the location of crime in various Milwaukee neighborhoods and properties, finding that a very small minority of landlords were hosting the vast majority of crimes. They even were able to control for dangerous neighborhoods by comparing the landlords with extractive practices, more code violations and more evictions, with other landlords. And they found that, all else equal, properties owned by landlords with a pattern of extractive management have dramatically higher rates of assault. Property managed by extractive landlords also show higher levels of burglary, robbery, and other types of crime. And lest you think that that's just in Milwaukee, back in 2022, another group of researchers examined crime in all 148 neighborhoods of Richmond, Virginia, and found that despite looking for associations between crime and data like population density, race, income, food stamps, and even alcohol outlets, the only variable that was significantly associated with crime was, wait for it, the property owner failing to pay property tax. They write that taken together with previous studies, this evidence suggests that the neighborhood instability caused by those outside a given community, e.g. negligent landlords and business owners, rather than residents, may play a significant role in fostering an environment conducive to violence in cities like Richmond, Virginia. That previous research they mentioned is also pretty interesting and provides a glimmer of hope and even a roadmap forward for some tenants. This case study from 2018 describes a specific neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called East Liberty, where 10 years prior, crime was the highest in the city. The residents there got fed up and they formed their own real estate investment group with the explicit goal of buying properties from slumlords and revitalizing them. Over the next few years, crime in that neighborhood dropped by 49%. Uh Uh-oh, it's another stereotypical Rebecca saying, collective action works. 
So yeah, what clearly happened in Aurora, Colorado is that a slumlord on the other side of the country bought some properties and optimized them for maximum profit and minimum effort. Refuse to improve anything, collect a bunch of fees, refuse to give back deposits, evict anyone for any reason you can. The degraded properties attract more crime, and when the news media and city finally noticed, they hired a PR firm to drop the name of a scary gang of immigrants and leak a video of them to Fox News, who will always choose to go with the immigration bad narrative before even considering the capitalism bad reality. And to the average person, what's easier to grasp, more comforting, and more fun to believe? That our entire housing system is inherently unfair and benefits the wealthy who exploit the poor? Or that Joe Biden let a gang of immigrants in and now our own gang of Americans are going to fight them for freedom? This may surprise you, but I was once a landlord. Kind of. When I was 21, I was living in low-income housing in Seattle when my building manager announced that she was leaving and she suggested that my boyfriend and I apply for the job together because it came with a free unit, 300 bucks a month, and it was pretty easy. So we did it. And I'm glad we did because it was very fascinating. Uh, I learned that I, along with nearly every tenant in the building and all of my friends, had no idea what our rights are as renters. As a direct result of what I learned in that job, when I moved back to Boston a few years later, I was able to recognize that I had accidentally rented from a slumlord (laughs) and I knew uh, that I could do something about it. When I was a month into my first winter with no heat and a shower that only occasionally shot out hot water, Uh, I knew that was against the law, so I called my landlord and I asked her to fix it. And when she said that I was just a wimp who should put on a sweater and it wasn't really that bad, I went to the city and I refused to leave the building department until someone agreed to come and evaluate the problem. And even the inspector was shocked at the condition of my apartment. And he hit my landlord with a hefty fine and forced her to fix everything immediately. Of course, she then went back to ignoring me, uh, even though the only thing I complained about after that was a little drip coming from the ceiling in the bathroom. Uh, She ignored my first message about it. She ignored my messages a month later saying, hey, drip's getting worse. Uh, She ignored my messages uh, for a while after that when I was reporting that looked like the paint in the bathroom was bubbling. Uh, And when I came home from work one day to find the bathroom ceiling in the bathtub, She said, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not your housekeeper. If you don't like it, move out. So I did. And then I went back to her house to get my deposit back by telling her I was going to sue her if she didn't write me a check right then and there. And then I got a better apartment. The poor, mostly immigrants living in CBZ's slums don't have the resources I had. They don't know their rights. They probably don't have the time to go to the city and demand action. And some of them may not even speak English very well, or they may be worried about their immigration status. So they put up with these conditions until the city shuts down their housing, leaving them with mere days to find something new. That's the real story here. We must do more to educate people about their housing rights. And further, we must stop predatory landlords from buying up these properties and letting them go to ruin. If you are a renter and you are hearing my voice right now, please learn about your rights. You know, look them up online. They vary from state to state and city to city, but chances are you have more rights than you realize. And You should fight for those rights, fight for them tooth and nail, because your neighbor might not be able to. But if you can do it, you will not only be helping yourself, you'll be helping your neighbor, and you'll be helping the community at large. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you loved the video, please subscribe. And if you think the world could use more videos like this and you happen to have a few bucks laying around, head to patreon.com slash Rebecca and join an awesome community of nerds like the people whose names you see on the screen right now. Thanks.